it's Lisa from Been There Got Out. And I know we don't usually do uh, Instagram Lives on Wednesday, but we just had to for this guest. Um, so today we are welcoming Caroline Strassen. There she is. Um, we were on her podcast. Wait, let me get her on right. We were on her podcast, Stick Abuse and Trauma Recovery Podcast. And um, I'm so happy that you're on today because we the first time we met thanks for coming we had so much to talk about i was scribbling notes all over the place and it's been hard to narrow down a topic i think i have but we'll see where this takes oh, us oh it's so good to be here it's lovely to see your face again it really really is it's great to be here oh you too okay so caroline for those that don't already know you and i'm sure whoever sees this now and later probably do can you just give us like a little introduction, brief background of what brought you to this? Yeah, so as you know, my name's Caroline Strawson. So I'm a trauma therapist and coach and I specialize in um, healing the trauma of narcissistic abuse. So I'm a trauma geek. Um, I have such an interest in narcissism because I went through my own narcissistic relationship with a covert narcissist. I went through a very messy divorce myself and was diagnosed with PTSD, depression, anxiety, self-harm. And at the time I was a podiatrist, realized there wasn't much out there that would help me actually heal from that because a lot of it was just talking therapy. So I completely retrained. So I do a lot of somatic work like IFS and brain spotting and EMDR and, you know, culminate that um, all together and teach others how to become trauma-informed coaches in this space as well. All right, and we absolutely need that. And you know that the community that we deal with is always dealing with some kind of high conflict legal situation, whether it's separation, divorce, custody battles, any kind of post-judgment stuff. So um, it's, it's wonderful to talk to somebody who's been through it and you have a different angle because you deal with a lot of the mental health stuff that's associated with going through the family court system. And that's what we talked about a lot in our podcast with you on, you know, on yours. So um, one of the things that we know that we both, both felt and that many people listening to this feel is a constant sense of dread, no matter what, no matter what. It's always like, I'm going to get in tr trouble. Yeah. If I'm not perfect, I'm going to get in trouble. Why? Where do you think this comes from? Yeah. Yeah, so when we're in that heightened state, it's actually within our nervous system. So our nervous system is really at the heart of our lived experiences. And whenever we feel anything that isn't coming from a place of presence or calm, often it's us going into a stress or trauma response within our nervous system. And that hierarchy, if you think of it, I, I, when I teach this, I call it the traffic lights of tolerance. So the green light is when we feel safe and connected, it's our social engagement system, and we're very, very present then we have if we detect any danger we'll shift into the sympathetic which is our fight fight response we'll mobilize some more energy we'll produce more cortisol and we're really really edgy and we really really feel like this and if we still perceive threat and danger we'll move into a freeze response and that's where we're really um working on keeping the major organs alive and that's where we'll feel really tired it feels like everything is an effort and normally what happens when people are going through high conflict divorces especially with narcissists is people tend to go into a freeze response but there is a really high sympathetic charge underneath all of that so they feel really really tired but they're really edgy and like you say it's that sense of doom what's going to happen next and the body is really in a nervous system response almost like the second before something horrific is going to happen so we're pumping out all of this cortisol this is why many people get ill and poorly when they're going through divorces because it starts to lead to chronic illness and people get diagnosis like ibs and fibromyalgia because literally our body is in a trauma response because our perception of going through the court system is dangerous now when i say dangerous I mean, the perception to our nervous system, it's like life-threateningly dangerous. Um, and that's why we go into a trauma response. Now, it isn't actually dangerous. It's our perception. And as human beings, when we are growing up as children, we will perceive other people's behavior in a certain way. Normally, then, if something um, awful is happening, people are saying not nice things to us. We create an emotional wound and everything for us 
comes about not feeling that core wound and those core wounds tend to be things like I'm not good enough I'm not worthy I'm not important so of course when you're going through say a divorce with a narcissist if you have that core wound the narcissist the court system is triggering it and that becomes your version of danger so your body goes into this trauma response and you're literally in that heightened activated response feeling literally like you're on edge all of the time about to explode you're like literally a coiled spring yeah i know we see um like you said earlier our bodies um respond to this and not just short term with living in this constant state of like being on high alert but how does it affect us in in terms of long-term health because we get client like a number of clients have that we see have had cancer or um, fibromyalgia or things with their kidneys? Do you, do you notice specific areas of the body that are, are um, affected specifically by this type of uh, trauma? It, it's anything really. I mean, you know, we live in a society where so many people are living lives in a trauma response. You know, people are living in fight, flight or freeze and it becomes their version of normal. You know, people don't know what it's like to feel safe and connected. And, and that doesn't mean there aren't challenges. It just means that the nervous system is flexible enough, stretchy enough to be able to stay within a tolerance level as opposed to dipping into these trauma responses. Now, when we are, when we are stuck in these trauma responses, is longer than we actually need to because of course we'll need them if we were being attacked or something physically or something was happening of course we're going to need these so we need these biological um, responses the problem being is when we're actually safe but in challenging situations but our nervous system perceives them to be actually dangerous for us so it's the same for any type of stress really you know stats are set research says now probably 90 percent of disease and illness is caused by stress and, and as being in this trauma response longer than we need to this then leads to inflammation within our body it leads to our um, systems shutting down because if we're in a fight flight or freeze response we're literally in that survival mode you know our nervous system our body systems they're not bothered if our digestive system's working well we just need to survive it's not bothered you know about anything else going on in our body it just literally wants us to survive and get through those moments and it's sort of a moment to moment but we end up being stuck in these because the situations externally are reminding us about something on a deeper level we feel about ourselves you know people aren't hearing me the narcissist is taking me to court that must mean I'm not in important that's triggering that core wound again everything is going back to past experiences so we end up being present physically in our body but the nervous system is actually reacting to past experiences it's trying to protect us you know it's doing a wonderful job of protecting us from our perception of our past experiences the problem being is it ends up leading to disease and illness very often yeah and you know something you said made me think of a comment we've heard from a lot of people is that when it's quiet, that's when they feel even more terrified. Absolutely, because they almost, if you think there's a term, and I'm sure many of, of your audience will have heard of trauma bonding. Well, trauma bonding with a narcissist is, you know, we have these like highs and lows of, you know, when they're love bombing and everything's going well and we're producing the cortisol, the, serotonin, um, the, sorry, the serotonin, the dopamine, you know, it feels good. And then when we go into the discard phase or we set boundaries and then we obviously they push back and we start to produce more cortisol, that actual cycle of cortisol hormone secretion in our body we become addicted to so when we are in that relationship with a narcissist and even when we come out and we're going through say a court process or the divorce our body then is waiting and almost craving for the next rush of cortisol we're actually looking for it and we become addicted to struggle you know it drop us Isn't a love that hive. crazy it, it is i mean drop us a love hive any listeners now can relate to almost feeling addicted to struggle feeling like and, and again i used to say these phrases to myself i think why does drama always follow me around everywhere? Why are all these bad things happening to me? Actually, this was me sometimes seeking these things out because my body was literally addicted to the cortisol production. So for me to feel calm felt very alien. That actually felt dangerous for me to feel calm. I needed the rush of the cortisol, of the adrenaline, because that's what my body had become addicted and used to being in the narcissistic relationship and often very much taking me back to childhood as well. You know what you're saying?
saying is making me immediately think about when people come out of these toxic relationships, they often repeat the cycle. And that addiction to struggle and drama sounds like that same sort of theme, right? Like if you meet a nice person who's calm and treats you well without drama, it feels boring. foreign and it's scary. Yeah, boring. Why should it I get involved with that person? It is. And, and, and this is when we work with trauma, you know, what we think and what we feel, they're two different things. You know, I knew I was good enough, yet I still felt like I wasn't. So, you know, many of us come out of narcissistic relationships and know, you know, eventually if we want to get back in another one, that's a, you know, I, I said, I'm never getting married again ever. And obviously I'm remarried now. But at the time, at the time, someone could have put like the most amazing person in front to me and I would have sabotaged it because it wouldn't have felt like a normal version of love for me it would have been boring in some respects you know I needed that rush I needed to be in relationships where I didn't feel good enough because that was my version of normal love and you know and that's when we start to produce all of those hormones again but that's what my body became addicted to and what my body knew that though in the long run you know certainly for me you know I have a heart condition now that I am convinced came from my narcissistic abuse so so I have long QT syndrome. I also was diagnosed with fatty liver disease. I'm convinced my hay fever allergy that came on where I was six months pregnant was because around that time I found out that my husband was having an affair. So again, the antihistamine, the release of all of that, you know, all of that during hay fever. So that's three health conditions that I'm convinced came about because of the abuse from the, my narcissistic ex-husband. Wow. And you're making me think too, in terms of health effects, like my daughter, uh, had she was 11 or 12 when she was diagnosed with celiac wow. an autoimmune disorder and i was thinking the timing was so interesting because it was after the split like right after but that's the kind of um illness that people or condition that people often know from birth but hers just manifested at that time <laughs> absolutely so it's interesting yeah uh, autoimmune disorders are very much and there's a loads of research coming through about this now with autoimmune disorders you know it's the body really internally attacking itself and if we're producing a lot of cortisol you know our immune system will shut down and then we get things like autoimmune disorders you know i'm convinced my mom who was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in her mid-30s this came from her childhood trauma and then being married to my father and really you know i work with ifs and protector parts you know for my mom the rheumatoid arthritis was a great protector part for her because although she was in pain with her arthritis it was still a great distraction from the pain that her nervous system thought would be more painful feeling sort of like a, a teenage young girl who wasn't good enough so you know whenever we manifest and that's not to say of course there will be some physical conditions that come about that aren't trauma related you know but I would always say to people whenever I work with my clients or my communities you know how much of any physical illnesses that you have and chronic illness how much of that could be exacerbated by trauma and how much of it could be physical just a physical manifestation of something as well and that's where you would look at other things like you know you check your hormones if you're perimenopausal you know you can look at toxic mold you can look at your um, the food the nutrition that you're eating so it's not just a one size fits all this is a holistic approach but definitely looking at the trauma piece in all of this because so many of us are carrying unprocessed trauma in our body and all we're doing is suppressing it all the time and it needs to come out you know we need to process that we need to express that so that the body and the brain can actually complete these response cycles to go back to a homeostasis otherwise we're literally suppressing it all of the time yeah and you know what you said makes me think of um something i found absolutely fascinating from one of our first conversations we were talking about how a lot of people that we work with say, who are in the middle of a very difficult court case say, I am so interested in advocacy right now. Yeah. I wanna throw mm -hmm. myself into advocacy and get involved with that. And we say, you know, do that later, but they feel like they wanna do it now. And you said that that's actually um, a specific type of response. I don't wanna finish your answer, but can you talk about what you said? Cause I, I found it mind blowing. Yeah, I mean, when we go through court cases and we're seeing the injustice out there because you know, globally the court system around divorce where there is abuse and certainly narcissism in particular, you know, narcissism is a dirty word, isn't it? You know, you say, your ex is a narcissist and of course there's eye rolling and you know but it, narcissistic abuse is domestic abuse you know we need to name it because narcissists don't take any accountability or responsibility now the problem being when you're going through your own divorce and you start to see all of the flaws in the uh, court system it's actually
actually triggering wounds in yourself because you feel you're not important or you're not good enough. So you want to fix it. You want to almost rescue the whole court system. And of course, that is something to do at some stage. But when you do that and your focus becomes on that, what happens is your focus comes away from your task in hand. Focus on your own court case initially when you're doing this and how you can regulate yourself so that when they say work with like yourselves they're able to you know get better results i mean you know is there such a thing as the best result when you we're working within a broken court system but certainly the best result you possibly can whilst you're working on regulating your emotions and then when you come through all of that that's when you can start to focus and work on, you know, making change, you know, becoming an advocate in this space as well and being a voice for that. But doing it whilst you're trying to go through your own case, firstly, it takes your time away from your children. It will take your time away from the task in hand. And that's what you need to focus on. It doesn't mean you can't get there, but right now just focus on yourself. Yeah, I remember you were calling it. It's actually a response to trauma to want to help other people. And it does take that focus away. And that's like in our nature, it's easier to deal with other things than yourself. And we think about all the time, people we work with, we say, you're like the superhero, you always want to come in and fix things. And it's so hard for people in these situations to focus on themselves to give that same attention to themselves. It's almost like they want to avoid dealing with their yeah, they see it as a bigger picture. And these are all traits of codependency as well. You know, we have a lack of self-love. So, you know, we're, we're seeing it. it's not just about us. It's about the world. You know, we want to fix the world and rescue the world. And it's very much a trait of people who are empaths as well. You know, we want to fix things. We want to see the changes that are there. But ultimately, we have to be really mindful because your, your health is the priority in that moment as well. Doesn't mean you can't get to that stage too. And the other thing is, if you want to be an advocate, occurred if you're going through your own case and you are really emotional as well and i see this a lot online you know what we want as advocates in this space are, are more regulated individuals who are able to get the point across and, do, and not lose the messaging by being dysregulated while trying to say the message so it's not the right time to be that advocate during it still get the support, take notes, journal, all of those wonderful things that you can do. But ultimately, focus on yourself in all of this. There, there's a, there'll be a time and a place where you can do the rest. Yeah. yeah, and it's interesting because you're making me think of one thing that we have to work on all the time with our people, and that's the ability while they're in the court system um, to remain calm while presenting their case, if, if they have a lawyer or not. Because when you're calm, um, people listen to you. So often we'll talk about different elements of persuasion and convincing a judge or a, a child um, evaluate, you know, a custody evaluator that to, to believe you. But if you are so emotional that whatever facts you have don't come out as credible because you're just it's just too much for people. And, um, and that often plays into the hands of a narcissist as well. You know, they will often then try and make out then almost like, hey, you know, look what I'm dealing with kind of thing. You know, so so I do. I think it's getting that balance right. I think it's OK to show some emotion because then, that you know, people can see you care. But just like you say, you know, if we're kind of, you know, wailing in the courtroom and crying and stuff it doesn't mean we're not feeling it and there's a time and a place we can go and express that but when we are in the courtroom we really need to be trying to be as regulated as possible because when we're more regulated we're in a different part of our brain we're in the front part of our brain our more logical and rational part we're able to verbalize the, the points the facts you know because so many people i know and i'm sure you will have the same that i've gone into the court system been so dysregulated and activated and then come away and beating themselves up because they didn't get across the points that they wanted to get across. And, you know, we don't want that. We want people to go in, feel seen, feel heard, all of these are attachment wounds, all of these types of elements so that they can come away and regardless of the result, at least feel like that they have got their points across that they want to stay as well. Yeah, we talked about uh, together, the two of us, the importance of strategy yeah. before going into mm -hmm. court. And that's exactly one of those reasons. And one of the things that I'm thinking of in terms of the emotion is uh, one of our friends who's an attorney was saying that it was very easy for him to argue in court with a pro se, which is someone who was representing themselves without an attorney, because it was easy to get under that person's skin. Yeah. Because of, and, and, you know, I've been pro se for years and I really had to learn to be very calm because you have to recognize that no matter how much you want 
the courts to care. You are just a business transaction. Come and on. that's, it is what it is. And once you kind of accept that and learn to operate that way, you have a much greater chance of success. But just banging your head against the wall saying it shouldn't be this way is really not helping anybody, no, especially you. Correct. And I think, again, we all know it shouldn't be that way. And that's about acknowledging and validating people and saying, absolutely, it isn't fair because it isn't fair. But working with what we have, and like you say, you know, it's prepping the nervous system before we go into the court, you know, doing all lots of things where we can really get our nervous system in a state of more what we call ventral vagal, where it's, uh, it's as calm as it possibly can be. Having strategies that when you're in the court, if you're starting, you know, tracking your physiology. So when you start to feel something in your body, really tracking that and either pausing, stop and have a glass of water. You know, I, I teach something called bilateral tapping, so which is like a form of EMDR. So doing some bilateral tapping actually in the courtroom, again, to keep yourself as much as possible in your neocortex, the front part of the brain, so that it doesn't mean you're not feeling something. It just means you can just about stay within that window where you are able to hold that emotion. There will be a time you can go out and then you can ground yourself when you feel it and you can express it the moment you come out of the courtroom. But during, you want to be able to get your point across as well. And I think, you know, this isn't about, like you say, we would love to say, just go in and say and feel and do whatever you know is right and truthful. It doesn't work like that. You know, sadly, we have to work the system as well to get the results that you want to get in there too. And that means strategy like with yourselves and then really navigating, you know, how to regulate your emotions as much as possible through a really challenging time of your life. Yeah. And um, what you said about that. Well, I remember I had posted a video, video of yours a couple of weeks ago where you did go through drinking an ice cold glass yes. of water. Do you want to just quickly summarize that? Yeah. So, so again, when we go offline in the brain, if you think about this as like the brain in the palm of your hand, Dancy Girl does a really great analogy. So this is like your brain stem. This is your limbic system, your emotional part of your brain, your thumb. And then this is your prefrontal, your neocortex, this front part of your brain where we're more logical and rational. Now, what can happen is if you're in the court, you might go in and you're in the front part of your brain, you're really ready. And like you say, an attorney or a lawyer might just really try and get underneath your skin and you flip your lid, you know, that they get to you. So we move into that emotional part of the brain. Now, what we want to do at this point is get ourselves back online into the front part of our brain, having a really icy cold glass of water. So take a bottle in or have one there and taking a sip and even saying things like, I just need to, I just need a moment. I just need to take a sip of my water. So it gives you a pause point within the, within the cord. And if you have that icy cold glass of water, because all you will focus on in that second is the icy coldness of the water, it helps you get back online into the front part of the brain because you cannot focus on ice and cold in your limbic system, you, it makes yourself come back online because it gets you back into the present moment. And it doesn't mean that it's still not emotional, but it might just be enough to help you stay more regulated in that moment when you are in the court. Yeah, I was thinking um, in our court system, they won't let us take water in, but we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't take water, not even into the building. Wow. Um, there's water fountain there, but it's not icy cold. But we often tell our people, make sure you have some kind of talisman or something that you can focus on with the same idea that it grounds you. And I know um, one of our clients recently, when we were prepping her for court, she was saying, I think I'm going to bring in some kind of eucalyptus oil because that reminds that me of when I was a child yeah. and, and how it comforted yes. me. Or sometimes we'll say, bring in a photograph of your children. Right. Just anything to get that brain focused. Absolutely. Any of the five senses to use to get yourself back online absolutely and another um technique you could use so this is what i teach on some of my programs as well and that's about bringing a protector figure in with you so we would use a form of bilateral stimulation again a form of emdr and and, and again when we're practicing it we would do like a butterfly tap with this but you can just do it on the sides of your thighs if you wanted to if you're in the court because obviously you don't want to be there in the court like this <laughs> right, right, right. you would you would envisage if you could take any Anybody in the world who you felt would be like this amazing protector figure into that court with you, 
who would you like to take? So we would do this so before they go in. Now I have had many people, I've had people say Oprah Winfrey, I've had people say Nelson Mandela, The Rock, The Rock's been a popular one uh, with all of this. Because when you feel what it would be like if you were say walking in with like Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, and you tap in that feeling, all of a sudden your nervous system starts to calm. Now our brain works really well where it doesn't recognize if they're there or not. We can actually tap into the feeling as if they actually are. So you can prep and before you're going in, you've got the rock there, you can tap into the feeling of having them there. And then when you're in there again, if that attorney is trying to get under your skin, just sort of bilaterally tap on the sides of your thighs, envisage the rock or whoever you want there and tap into that same feeling again. And it helps you get back online into the front part of your brain. It, the brain won't recognize if they're there or not. We, you know, that's the beauty of our brain with our imagination and the vis visualization element of this. We can tap into the feelings because that's what we want to change in the moment the feeling of feeling safer because we've got that amazing protector figure with us that is so so interesting and as you're talking i'm thinking it it sort of goes with things we've been telling people to do that i've been doing that i didn't even realize is a similar idea we talk about the importance of wearing something to court yeah. or what you can bring to court and and for years I, my I, one of my favorite aunts who's very new york city um assertive confident um, she died and she gave me a pair of these vintage suede knee high boots and they, I call them my court boots and every time I go to court I wear those boots because I feel like she's with me and her spirit is sort of like it's saying you can do it and I'm bringing her with me into that court and so just like what you're saying and I didn't even realize that yeah. that was a thing. So I always say, you know, power dress. So the day before, not on the day of your court appointment, the day before lay out your clothes. And I say, even like your power pants, you know, literally from your underwear outwardly, <laughs> What makes right. you feel, so when you put it on, you feel your posture change. You feel like you are safer. You feel like you are more present. And do that the day before as well. So it's not that you're doing it on the morning, thinking, gosh, what do I wear? You've prepped everything. So that on the morning, you're not thinking, well, what do I wear? You're literally in the zone. You are focused um, in all of this. And one of the other things that I say is, run through what we call a mind movie as well. So, you know, go, almost go in. You're the director of your mind movie of your court case so this could be the week before a few days before and literally you're the director looking at what may or may not happen and go through different scenarios they say this they say that what we do then is we prep the amygdala then we're prepping the brain of well if this happened i'd still be okay i could say this i could say that so we're creating a library of sentences and phrases and feelings that we might have in the court because we prepped everything we prepped the brain the nervous system we know what clothes we're wearing we have you know resource tools when we go into that courtroom as well we might have a protective figure with us in all of this so that you know again it doesn't take away that it's a nice situation it absolutely isn't and it can be scary and it can, it's challenging but it's not life-threatening you know hopefully not anyway but on the whole most aren't right. and so really what we want to look at is from a container perspective is really working on our nervous system regulation both before and during and then even after I say to people go and have a bath or a shower and literally almost feel like you're washing off the poison that has infected your skin <laughs> from being in the court and watch that water go down the plug hole so that you can then recenter you can leave the court where it is you're not carrying that dysregulation with you for a day two weeks three weeks four weeks because there you are you're pumping out the cortisol again that's going to lead to more disease and chronic illnesses yeah, and I, it's interesting, again, because when you talk about prepping for court, we, we do it on a level, too, where all those um, worst-case scenarios of, like, I, don't, I hope they don't ask me this question. Yeah. No, let's just say they are going to ask you this question. Let's get ready to come up with an answer that you're calm, you're practiced, you know, like, the things you're most afraid of, we've already gone over and figured out a way that it's going to be okay. And also, when you talk about that container perspective, I'm thinking – all you have to do, like you, you've heard the term, like one day at a time for AA, okay. like all you have to do is get through this. Let's just focus on getting through this and you're going to be okay. Absolutely. You just have to get through this day and then we'll deal with it later, but it's going to be okay and nothing is permanent and don't worry about, oh, awfulizing then if this happens and like, just let's get through this appearance. Absolutely. And, we'll and, it's, and it's really important from a healing perspective because so many of us are focusing on where we think we're not. 
And, you know, so take like Mount Everest, you know, we focus on the summit of Mount Everest of where we think we should be, where we think we need to head up to. And it seems too much. So our nervous system will go into shutdown. What we need is base camp one. You know, I know when I was actually going through my healing process, I had to literally go down to the hour and focus on for my nervous system one hour at a time. Because other than that, it was too much. And I'd go into shutdown. I'd start thinking, mm. oh, I'm not doing this. And I'm not feeling, I'm not moving forward forward I'd start criticizing myself so I literally needed I remember I used to wake up and think right get to breakfast and then I'd get to breakfast and like okay now to get to lunch time okay now I get to tea time now I get to bedtime and then it would start to expand a bit and then I'd have a weekend and think oh, I haven't cried this weekend well and celebrate the wins so don't just look about where we're not also celebrate how far you've come. It may not feel like it to you, but you absolutely will. And don't put a time scale or a destination of where you think you should be. Healing is a journey. There is no destination. You know, the beauty in some respects of being in abusive relationships and even going through the court system is it gives us an opportunity to heal the wounds that were already there. The court system, the narcissist, they are just triggering wounds within us that were already there. And this is our opportunity then to take back our power, to work within so we can go on, and we call this post-traumatic growth, to go on and have an even better life because of the trauma we have been through as well. And I certainly know that that has been the case for you. I know it's the case as well. And for myself, you know, we've been through this horrific trauma, but actually, you know, we're living purposeful lives now, doing the stuff that we love and are so passionate about, you know, and I know my relationships are better now, all of that. So, you know, I feel real gratitude for my ex-husband because he's never going to know what true happiness is about. But for me, don't get me wrong, it was horrific going through it. And I would never yeah. want to go through it again. Right. But actually, it was the opportunity to heal my not good enough wounds that were already there. And, you know, he was just a big spotlight on that. Yep, totally. And I think what you're talking about too, we, we also remind our people of is the progress. You've been making progress. Like here you are now. Just getting out of the relationship is so tremendous. So many people don't. So it's so important to recognize that. I know we're, um, I don't want to keep you here all day, Carolyn, but I do want you to talk a little bit about the types of trauma therapy you do. You mentioned somatic. So we, we said how um, sometimes talking therapy doesn't work. I want you to make sure you also mention brain spotting because I had never heard that before. Absolutely. I mean, talking therapy is really valuable in validating your experiences. And it's really important to have somebody to do that. But actually, if we keep talking about the trauma we've experienced, what happens is we keep wiring it in. And we often, some, that's why sometimes people say, God, I feel even worse, because we're wiring it in even more. So to really heal from abusive relationships, narcissistic relationships, or indeed any type of trauma, we need to work in the body. So I use a combination of things like internal family systems. So I part smack people, you know, if we've got people pleasing, self-harm, addictions, procrastination, these are actually your protection to parts of us um, and it's a very non-shaming non-pathologizing way of working with clients and, and everybody I do this with loves it it's brilliant it's such a great therapy um, integrating somatic experiencing which again is, is utilizing slowing everything down working in the body and integrating that Lots of people will have heard of EMDR, so eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And then brain spotting as well. So brain spotting is using eye position. So our eye position, so where we look affects how we feel. You know, you will often find that if we're looking around, you know, you'll start to watch people and you'll see. And we hold a brain spot. So we hold that eye position and it helps us process trauma right all the way back to our brain stem. So our optic nerve goes all the way back to the back of our brain and into our brain stem. So we're able to really process and integrate that. I use a lot of breath work. I use something called safe and sound protocol, which is an auditory vagal nerve stimulator to really help calm the nervous system and really integrating all of that together with positive psychology. Because, you know, a lot of people know what they don't want. They know they don't want to feel like that. So as we're processing all the inner child stuff and working there, but then it's like, well, okay, what do we want out of our life? How do we step into our best self? How do we live our best life now? And that's the bit I love then integrating the positive psychology piece, which is the scientific study of what makes us happy so it's a real process of sort of regulating in the present looking at inner child healing and then really looking ahead so that you can live your best life even if you've still got challenges as well because you still can do that 
So this is a weird question, but Chris and I just got certified as scuba divers. And one of the things I realized scuba diving was a lot of what you just described, breath work, you have to make sure to breathe and you're always looking all around. And I wonder if that's the sort of activity that is also very helpful for healing Absolutely. because it fits exactly what you're saying and I never thought of that really before. Is. And there's a difference between breathing techniques and breath work. You know, our, our breathing is one of the only things we can do in our body that is both voluntary and involuntary. So, you know, we're not thinking of breathing, but we can focus on our breath. So breath work is really about, you know, doing things on a daily or weekly basis where we're really helping our breath go back to a sense of normality. But breath work doesn't necessarily work on the root cause of why our breath isn't actually as it should be anyway. So breathing techniques are things like I do something called the VU breath. So this is about mobilizing energies where we kind of go VU. And what that does, again, we're really vibrating the voice box and where that vagus nerve is as well. So there's a difference between breath work and breathing techniques. Both absolutely have a place. I use both in the work that I do. I use both with myself as well. I do a lot of breath work. And also, you know, if I want to mobilize a little bit of energy, sometimes if I'm feeling a bit flat, I'll do some boo breathing um, as well. So, so breathing techniques get to the root cause of things. And breath work is very much around the maintenance and symptom management of things as well. Oh, it's fascinating. Okay, so Carolyn, how can people find you and how can they maybe study some of what you're talking about with you? Yeah, so I mean, again, come and follow me over on Instagram, drop me a message. I have a, a free support group on Facebook as well. So if people are more than welcome, drop me a message and I can send you um, the link to that. I also actually teach people how to become narcissistic trauma-informed coaches or somatic trauma-informed coaches. You know, there is such a shortage of trauma-informed professionals out there who really understand, you know, the effects of trauma. And there's a lot of embodiment techniques that you will learn in that of how a lot of the stuff that I've spoken about um, in the in the live today, you get taught. So, you know, even if you've never coached before, you know, I teach you everything that you're going to need and even how to build a business as well. So, you know, so, so again, whatever anybody needs and, and like yourself, you know, just meeting people with where they are at. I have a podcast, Narcissistic Abuse and Trauma Recovery. So, you know, loads of free stuff, but equally there's stuff if people want to work with me, you know, on, on different levels, just kind of drop me a message. You know, I'm, I'm there to serve and help as much as I possibly can for anybody. Oh, thank you so much, Caroline, for coming. Thanks for hosting us on your podcast. And let's definitely stay in touch. Definitely. Thank you for asking me. We okay. appreciate it. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everybody.